Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras and coming up in today's newscast, the latest attempt to legislate Prime Minister Netanyahu out of politics hits the Knesset floor for a vote. Israeli health authorities weigh in on the latest claims that Russia has achieved a successful coronavirus vaccine. And finally, an amazing Israeli athlete reinvents what it means to dance. A controversial and very high-profile bill hit the Knesset floor today. The draft legislation essentially taking aim at Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu by barring any lawmaker under indictment from forming a government. But with 53 votes opposed and only 37 in favor, the opposition-led proposal has been shut down. Netanyahu calling the bill's sponsor, opposition leader Yair Lapid of the Yeshatid party, a dictator. He adds that... The only places in the world where laws like these are passed are in dictatorships like Iran and North Korea. Now, I know what you're thinking. There are 120 Knesset members, but only 90 voted. So what happened to the final quarter of the government? Well, the opposition's Yamina party abstained from the vote, apparently to avoid confrontation with Netanyahu in the future. And then despite ongoing clashes between Netanyahu's Likud party and his partner, Benny Gantz's Blue and White, Blue and White did not show up for the vote either. Voting on such a bill would go against the unity agreement signed between them. Meanwhile, as for the budget crisis threatening to dissolve the government and throw Israel back to elections, the Knesset has passed a bill in its first reading today to delay the budget deadline from August 25 until November. Joining us with more on the upsets in the Knesset following the failure to pass a bill banning criminal defendants from forming a government is attorney and legal advisor from the Meshilut organization, Simcha Rotman. Simcha, thank you so much for being with us today. Now, what exactly was in the bill? The bill basically said that if uh, um, if a, a Knesset member, because uh, you cannot form a government if you are not a Knesset member, if a Knesset member is being indicted, he cannot form a government. He cannot get the job from the president to form the government. Now, uh, basically, this law is... Uh, many times we hear the people criticizing um, um, the Knesset and say we need a strong court coming from the party, from Yeshatid party and other parties, saying what will happen if the Knesset will legislate an undemocratic law. That's usually the claim. We need to defend the democracy from itself. Now, most of the laws that um, the opposition calls undemocratic, it's just laws that we don't like. This law is undemocratic. That law infringes on, on the very core of democracy because it says we are legislating it in order to prevent a specific person, in this case, Benjamin Netanyahu, we want to change the rules of the game that were in place since the founding of Israel. We want to give an unaccountable and undemocratically elected person the legal advisor, the ability to shut down every government, that's what we want to do. That is an undemocratic law, and, and it's coming from exactly the place that threatened us all the time from the Knesset legislating undemocratic law. All right, all right. well, well um, Netanyahu has alleged that only dictatorships have bills like these, but on its face, the bill simply says that someone under criminal indictment cannot form a government coalition. So is Netanyahu correct in this, that, it, that it's only a, a dictatorship-like bill? You know, where, where are there similar bills like this around the world? I, I, didn't, I don't know any place around the world who allows a person without any due process of law, meaning you can, the fact that someone was indicted in Israel or in most countries, it means it, it never, never ever a judge or a court saw the allegation and decided that he is guilty. Well, it's innocent so until proven guilty, right. Is innocent, exactly, is innocent. So to take a person, to throw allegations at him, to not give him the due process of law to defend himself and say, just by that we're preventing you from running for election is undemocratic. Now, the idea is that if, if the people, the vote, the voters decided that you're the representative 
that they want to block it, even with criminal allegations, it's problematic. And definitely when someone is not convicted. And that's why the basic law of Israel today says that anyone can run to the Knesset, and all Knesset members are equal, anyone can run to the Knesset unle uh, un unless he was prevented running by uh, the court according to a specific law. Well, so, so you must have... You must have uh, uh, you must have the a person the innocent. You must uh, uh, assume and presume that he is innocent. Innocent. All right, Simcha Rotman, thank you so much for for shining light on this bill and and what it means. Thank you. Now, moving from Jerusalem to Washington, after months of consideration, Democratic presidential hopeful Joe Biden has selected Senator Kamala Harris as his vice presidential running mate for the 2020 national elections. But what do Jewish or Israeli voters need to know about Biden's new partner? Mark Shulman, columnist for Newsweek and editor of HistoryCentral.com, joins us to discuss. Mark, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you back with us. Now, Harris has made history as the first black woman to be nominated for the position of vice president of the United States. And we're curious to know more about her, especially when it comes to her policy towards Israel. So what are her political views? OK, so she's very much a centrist Democrat. Uh, certainly before the last set of primaries, she was a California Democrat tied into the Jewish community in California. She appeared for four years in a row at APEC conferences. Uh, she'd feel very at home with a labor government. Will she feel her labor at, well at home with the Netanyahu government? That's a different story altogether. Like any Democrats, they'll have difficulties to some extent with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, she believes in a two-state solution. She doesn't believe in imposing a settlement. Um, she believes in re-entering the agreement with Iran with improvements made to the agreement. Mm. Where that'll lie, where that'll go, it's unclear at this moment. Um, of all the vice presidential possibilities, she's the one that Israelis have the least probably to be worried about. And um, a friend of mine um, had her over for Shabbat when she was visiting in, uh, I think it was 2017, and spoke about how she lit his grandmother's candles together with his wife. So she has that immigrant because she's, you know, she's not African American in that sense. Her parents were were half uh, Indian and half Jamaican. Um, different history there altogether. Um, she's certainly not uh, aligned with the far left part of the African sure. com American community. Well, more with the traditional African American community that has well, had strong ties so, with the Jewish community over the years. Well, now you've mentioned some of her positions on on Iran that she wants to rejoin the JCPOA, albeit with some. Uh, amendments, you know, I'm not really sure if Iran would go for that, but leaving that aside, what, you know, how does, how do her positions with the two-state solution as well line up with Biden's and the rest of the Democratic platform? Okay, it lines up very well with Biden's. It probably doesn't line up with Sanders, let's say, or some of the more uh, left-wing part of the Democratic Party, but it's the standard Democratic view of its two-state solution. Well, so what about, what about with Democratic inclusion. voters, then? Is she, is she going to be the kind look, of person that galvanizes look, the Democratic get, vote? Look, American Jewry has traditionally voted for Democrats throughout the last 50, 70, 80 years. They vote for Democrats because the Republicans have always been the party of exclusion. They were the party of the country clubs. And so for many, many years, the American Jewish community, with the exception of the Orthodox, have identified with the Democratic community. That will continue. I'm quite sure Biden will get at least 80% of the Jewish vote this year. Um, and there'll be issues, of course, with the, the very orthodox and people who think Israel is the single most issue, single and only issue, um, because no one will be as pro-Israel, even though it hurts Israel in the long run, as, as Trump has been. So um, I don't think we'll see any change in Democratic voting mm -hmm. patterns this year. As a matter of fact, I think there'll be more Democratic voters for Biden because of the sort of presidency that Donald Trump has brought and the anti-Semitism that he's brought with him um, as a result of nativism that's grown in the United States thanks to his presidency. All right, well, yeah, I guess my final question is, you know, what are your predictions for November? Because regardless of, you know, how you feel about Trump, he's certainly going to put up a fight. He's going to put up a fight. Look, the Biden and Harris have to get out of his way. He's been doing a very good job of, of destroying his own chances of re-election. Um, look, Everything points to the fact that he will be defeated. Will that really happen? I can't, we obviously can't say. I said this morning on a different news broadcast that I've been stand, sitting in the same studio 
four years ago, a day before the elections, and was sure that Hillary was going to win. I was wrong. I mean, she did win the popular vote, obviously. So I, you can't say with any certainty. Yeah. But right now, the polls overwhelmingly look to him winning. And of course, the economic and health situation in the United States is so dire that it's very unlikely that an incumbent president could withstand right. well, the current situation in the United States and be reelected. All right. Mark Shulman, thank you so much. My pleasure. Now, the race to defeat the coronavirus is picking up speed worldwide. Several nations, including Israel, inching closer and closer to a vaccination as infection numbers continue to balloon. But could it be that the race is over? Well, Russia seems to think so. In a landmark revelation, Russia is now claiming to have a definitively effective vaccine for coronavirus. Насколько мне известно, сегодня утром зарегистрирована впервые в мире зарегистрирована вакцина против новой коронавирусной инфекции. Я в этой связи хочу попросить министра здравоохранения Мурашка Михаила Альбертовича проинформировать нас поподробнее, хотя знаю, что она работает достаточно эффективно, формирует иммунитет устойчивый. И повторяю, прошла все необходимые проверки. President Putin, touting the alleged safety of the vaccine, even claims that his daughter has already received the inoculation. But many world leaders and health officials are receiving the news with a large pinch of salt, as it's only undergone less than two months of human testing. What we're seeing, especially on the part of leaders, is a political política. So we're seeing the é prevalecer a ótica política sobre a ótica científica. Having a vaccine, Debra, and proving that a vaccine is safe and effective are two different things. So I hope, but I haven't heard any evidence to make me feel that's the case, I hope that the Russians have actually definitively proven that the vaccine is safe and effective. I seriously doubt that they've done that. Similarly, the World Health Organization is saying that they've yet to receive enough information on the vaccine to evaluate it properly, let alone approve of its production and use worldwide. As for Israel, Health Minister Yuli Edelstein is agreeing that it's likely too early to tell for sure. <laughs> Meanwhile, Israeli infections are still soaring. The COVID-19 task force head, Professor Roni Gamzu, is warning that new lockdowns are practically imminent, as Israelis are neither getting tested for the virus enough nor adhering enough to regulations. Confirmed new infections rising overnight by another 1,800 to a total of over 87,000. Nearly 25,000 actively sick, 380 in serious condition, and the death toll rising to 633. Surprise anti-war protests made their way through Tel Aviv this week, but demonstrators had their focus set not on conflicts between Israel and Gaza or Iran or Lebanon, but rather on the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Nittany Manson with the story. Upwards of 500 people, immigrants to Israel from Azerbaijan, lining the streets by the Jaffa port on Monday. The protest organized by the Azerbaijan House, the Azerbaijan Jewish Diaspora Organization in Israel, coming in response to the latest Armenian provocation against Azerbaijan. The most recent outbreak of violence in a decades-long conflict over the Nagorno-Karabakh and surrounding regions of Azerbaijan. Though the latest exchange of fire takes place nearly 300 kilometers or 200 miles away from the Armenian-occupied Nagorno-Karabakh territory, breaking a shaky ceasefire along the Armenian-Azeri border July 12th, Armenian and Azerbaijani officials accuse one another of shelling both military and civilian positions on either side. The fighting then exploding over the following days, leading to the deaths of at least one civilian and 16 soldiers, including an Azerbaijani major general.
baktılar, akşam saat 12'den sərdi yediye kimi atmadılar, saat 7'de təzdən başladı, on, dünən iki gündə, 14, 14 günü tezdən atıldı, 14 günü tezdən nədir, 7'de 8 işlemiş başladılar. Danışanda atırdılar, dedi ki, atırlar, başlayıblar, e, onu da səs gəlir, dedi, işidirsən, dedim, işidirəm. Dedim, baba, bir yerdə, yəni, çölə bayra çox şey eləmə. O da səhər-səhər idi. Yəqin, kuxunanın şey, qabağımda olub düz. Yəqin, keç ürək yiyib, çıxırmış o yana keçməyə yəmək, yəni, necə mərmi düşüb. Yəni, onu... Yəni, ölən vaxtı, mərmi düşən vaxtı yanında heç kim olmuyor. Dozens of protesters gathering in the Azeri capital of Baku then, marching in solidarity with the Azeri army and chanting, Karabakh, our homeland is indivisible. But there's much more to this story than just the recent clashes. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, beginning with the disintegration of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, has never really ended. Both former Soviet nations, Azerbaijan and Armenia, lay claim to the region between them. The international community, though, does recognize Nagorno-Karabakh and the seven adjacent regions occupied by Armenia as sovereign Azerbaijan territory. Now, meanwhile, back in Israel, the 400-strong demonstration marched through the southern Tel Aviv Jaffa port, arriving at the Armenian Cultural Center and Armenian Church. Protest organizers explaining, though, that the demonstration was peaceful and not intent on provoking the Armenian Culture Center or the church. Rather, as citizens of Israel, they simply felt that as Armenia has no official representation in Israel, the Armenian Culture Center and church were the most suitable spot for the rally. Then, beginning with a minute of silence in honor of the recently killed, the rally moved on to playing hymns from the state of Israel and Azerbaijan, followed by demands for Israel to pressure Armenia and for Armenia to comply with the four UN Secretary Council's resolutions on this matter. The UN calling for Armenia to withdraw its armed forces from the Nagorno-Karabakh and seven adjacent regions, and to allow nearly one million Azeri refugees to return to the land. In other news, congratulations are due. Israeli Channel 20 news anchor and journalist Lital Shemesh has been chosen to serve as a judge at this year's Emmy Awards ceremony for television in the semifinals of the news category, and the ceremony being scheduled for September. Now, I'm very excited to hear about this great honor from the new judge herself. Please welcome Lital Shemesh. Lital, it's so, it's so great to have you back with us. Now, you join other Israelis... Thank you for having me. That's my pleasure. Now, you join other Israelis who have received an honor from the Emmy Award Committee, such as the actor and creator of Fauda, Leo Raz, and the talented actress Shira Haas, uh, who, has also announced, who was also announced as a candidate in the leading actress category. How did you feel when, when they approached you to serve as a judge? Um, I was uh, obviously very honored uh, to be chosen uh, as a judge, actually uh, in the news category, So, which means I was judging the news category of the Emmy. Um, I was very surprised to, to, to see the, the email uh, from, uh, from the Emmy, uh, Emmy's uh, committee choosing me as a judge uh, in the semifinals of, uh, of the news category. And, and yes, I'm, I'm very honored, very honored. It's a good thing. I'm just imagining what would have happened if the Emmy email went to your spam folder. But you are also now, you know, you're also now a leading newswoman in Israel, and you're judging the news category, as you said. But the news has greatly changed since the days when, you know, maybe you first started your career as a journalist. So what do you, what do you think makes a journalist or a news organization outstanding in today's world? Um, I think bringing uh, good news, good stories, really uh, bringing interesting uh, investigative stories um, and finding the truth and bringing it to the people, bringing a variety of opinions, um, as much of uh, different opinions as you can, as you can get um, on your news channel. I think throughout the years, we've seen the amazing change uh, um, in, in, the, in the news, in the news anchors, in the reporters, because of social media, uh, you no longer have only one-sided um, news um, news shows, but you have people responding on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, responding to your stories, responding to uh, to what you're saying on television. Which I think it's a great, great blessing. I think it's it's amazing that you have the audience, your audience, the people who are watching you, criticizing you, criticizing wow. journalists, um, commenting on what you're saying on television. And I think it's, it's a great blessing to today's uh, news. 
All right, now speaking of outstanding work, a few days ago, and we actually just saw visuals from that, you interviewed the Prime Minister Netanyahu in a special one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And one of Netanyahu's criticisms of the media in Israel is its alleged lack of objectivity. Do you think a journalist should have an agenda or should remain completely objective? Do you even think it's truly possible to be objective without being completely independent? Mm -hmm. To be honest, I think uh, these days and age, we can actually experience the fact that almost every journalist has some sort of opinion, of agenda, of point of view on the world. Uh, you can go and scroll down a journalist's uh, Twitter account or Facebook account, uh, read their opinion columns, I mean, and see what they're thinking. So it's really hard to really find someone who is 100% objective. I totally understand uh, Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu claiming that channel, uh, some channels in Israel are very biased, are very mm. against him. I think we can also see this polarization in the U.S. Um, yeah. against uh, President Donald Trump. Um, so the media should, whenever they're choosing uh, to press the button in, uh, you know, in the remote control, to know that what they're getting and, and what kind different types of, of news they're getting. All right. So I think maybe the, the moral there is to just get news from a wide variety of sources or as wide a variety as you possibly can. Lital, yes. congratulations again. It's so amazing. Uh, and good luck judging. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, talk about an award-winning show. This next Israeli social media celeb shows that there are many ways to be a star. My name is Noah. I'm 22 years old. I live in Tel Aviv. I used to be Israeli champion, Paul Volter, and now I'm dancing in the air. Hanging high above a terrifying, death-defying drop, the amazing Noah Toledo parties. I like the heights, I like the ex extreme, the adrenaline. I like to watch everything from above. You can see everything here. And you feel the wind. You can fly. And with nearly 60,000 followers on social media platform TikTok, it looks like the whole world is partying with her. But forget her online community for a second. Residents of the city whose facades Toledo cleans are equally big fans of the window washing star. When people see me behind the window, they are surprised. They see a woman. It's not usual. Uh, they give me water, chocolate, whatever I want, and it's very nice. Oh, she is divine. Every time when I see her, when she cleans the window, she waves, she smiles. She's the only one to ask if I'm happy, if it's really clean. Uh, she is the, the best of them. She's the only girl, uh, but always so nice. That's very different from the other cleaners, the boys. It's not all fun and games at the top of the world, though. Toledo's main goal being to inspire other young women to make their mark in traditionally male-dominated fields. I don't know a lot of women doing this job, but I hope when they see me, they understand women can do it too and show the boys women are strong. All right, now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight, yet another in a long line of warm evenings, the low sitting at about 74 degrees Fahrenheit or 23 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow, too, partly cloudy skies and warm temperatures again, with highs averaging 92 Fahrenheit or 33 degrees Celsius. And of course, now, before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Flashbacks to when I was a kid with my brothers. This is one of the best, most pure moments I think I've seen in a long time. Amazing. All right. That's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.41 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. 
I'm Aaron Porras, and thank you so much for watching.